Thank you, Mikey. Always a pleasure to uh, do this. Um, and I think the um, the idea today is really to kind of have a chat um, with Dahlia about her work, her approach, her experiences doing the work that she's done. And uh, we want to make it um, quite open and uh, also not focus so much on like the didactics of photography and the kind of, uh, uh, you know, the, the theory part, but rather, um, you know, uh, Dahlia's practical experience working uh, on the many projects that she has. I'm going to introduce Dahlia as if we're all friends and we've uh, joined a, a table at a restaurant. And um, uh, so I know Dahlia for many years. Uh, she is... Um, uh, you know, in, in the photography world, you meet a lot of people and, uh, uh, but you know, there are few people that leave an impression on you and Dahlia is one of them. She is, um, other than being a, a super talented, uh, 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 photographer and you'll see that with the work that she does. And, and it's, uh, it's a, it's a very, uh, poignant, um, and very kind of, um, different, uh, work that she, that she does, but, um, it's very, very important work. But as a person, she is uh, very kind and benevolent and always, uh, um, you know, uh, helping out other photographers and uh, has been involved in the photo scene. And I don't think there's anybody who is in Lebanon who works in media or activism or even in the region, uh, really, who doesn't know of, of Dahlia. And whenever you meet people and you're like, oh, you know, do work in Beirut and like, you know, Dahlia, of course, you know, I love Dahlia, you know. And so she really has that kind of um, spirit that that uh, resonates uh, across the um, um, the the world of uh, uh, photographers and uh, journalists and uh, you know and I think a more formal introduction Dalia um, you know did um, uh, study uh, art uh, in the late nineties in, in university in Lebanon um, and then uh, went on to uh, do uh, photography and then worked as the um, the uh, photo editor for AP at a crucial time in two thousand and six during the war and we'll get into that and then uh you know currently lives and works in beirut and uh is um uh you know uh, shooting assignments and when she's not doing her uh, own personal documentary projects is teaching workshops um and um and yeah and so with that we'll we'll get started um so this is a, a photo that I want Dalia to tell us a lot about, uh, tell us about, and also about how important it was in kind of shaping her kind of future going um, forward. So Dalia, tell us how you came to make this picture and what it has um, meant to you, if it does, uh, because I know that it, uh, you know, uh, attracted the attention of a lot of people and, you know, um, and it helped you get noticed and get assignments. So yeah, tell us a little bit about this image. Hi, Samji. First of all, thanks a lot for the introduction. I'm really uh, touched. <laughs> uh, second is, so I studied photography at a finance university, actually. So I majored in photography, but it was not photojournalism. It was uh, in a finance university. And this is why I had to do everything related to photography and not only photojournalism. So basically, I uh, studied architecture for two years and a half, and then I quit and I studied photography. And I was really um, excited to be doing reportage from the beginning. Uh, so I graduated in 99. And uh, I was working on different things uh, before all of a sudden a friend calls me in February 2002 and told me that she was uh, going to be part of a religious mission religious mission to uh, to Iraq and she asked if I would like to be uh, a part of the team and actually I'm not really into religion but I thought okay I could be, I could be part of the team going to Iraq because it was one of the countries I was really uh, interested in uh, going to. So we did. And uh, I took my analog camera, my black and white films, because I wanted only to do black and white, uh, inspired by Henri, de Car uh, Henri, Henri <laughs> Cartier-Bresson. Uh, and so uh, I remember that every time they had a nap, I was out taking pictures. And this picture actually was one of those really small villages we pa we we drove past while going from one part visiting archaeological sites. And it was um, uh, you know those really small villages where you have uh, like uh, twenty people living in a very small village. And so we stopped, uh, talked to the people, and I 
took pictures. The problem is that I, it was not a problem, but uh, I developed the films few months later after I came back to Beirut. And I was really surprised to see this image because I don't remember taking it. But um, this is when I met uh, actually a friend of mine and um, uh, it was published in different places because a friend of mine uh, suggested me to um, uh, to a European publication. And this is where it was my first publication. Uh, I published a story of Iraq in a Lebanese um, cultural journal, and the picture was part of it. And this is when I started thinking that this is what I wanted to do, you know, tell the pe stories of people and uh, talk about the aftermath of the crisis that they had on, they, they were living in. And this was actually during the, um, uh, what do you call it, Hisar, the, bloc the blockade of the U.S. on the Iraq. So it was just a year before the U.S. invasion. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so um, uh, you know, at this point, you're pretty firm in your desire to, um, you know, be a, a photographer, and you're on uh, assignment. Uh, you're, you're you're getting assignments, and you're starting to kind of make your way, um, you know, as a as a documentary news assignment uh, photographer. And then, um, uh, this is uh, early two thousand. So, talk us through how you got to become the picture editor or the photo editor at uh, Associated Press. Basically, in 2004, I also decided to go to the border of Jordan, Iraq, ask the UNHCR to help me because I discovered that there were people who were stuck on the border uh, when they fled the, uh, like the beginning of the Iraqi war. And they were Palestinians and Iranian Kurds. They were stuck in two camps on the border. And I went there and... Uh, like I was on and off between Lebanon and the border and uh, to be able to get into the, the camps, I was asked to, to give a workshop of photography to the kids. So I was doing photography with the kids and they were shooting and I was also doing my own work also in black and white, as you see. And um, so I did a big reportage there and I went back. It was in May, June, and I went back in November and some people had uh, were resettled. These are Iranian Kurds in the Karama camp. And some people were resettled. Some others were stuck on the border because they were Palestinians, obviously. So it was very interesting to, to be sitting with people, learning their problems. Um, it was obviously what people had to go through because of the wars that they had to live and uh, this is when I told you I started wanting to work on the aftermath and tell the stories of people who suffered from the wars that they were not part of, but they had to, like they were the victims of those wars. So basically, these are the images I did. The project was not published because I didn't know back then how to get in touch with the uh, editors, uh, but uh, the project was exhibited at the IMA, at, at Institut du Monde Arabe in Paris in 2005. And um, yeah, it's in my hidden website. <laughs> We're going to talk about that later. Um, uh, so uh, thanks for sharing these. And then um, if we can, um, uh, then I think we just take a moment now to talk about um, uh, your editorial, uh, your, your AP assignment. Yeah. So to be able to uh, do those stories that I started doing and started being interested in doing much more, I decided that I needed to take, like to, 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 to make some money in order to, have the, like be self-funded when I do my projects. Okay, so um, I was asked to be the photo editor, like I applied to be the photo editor of uh, at the AP, um, at the Associated Press uh, office in Beirut. Mm -hmm. And I took, took the job in 2005, it was in May. I was still doing an internship when, I mean, I, I started working after the assassination of uh, the Prime Minister Hariri, and then after this, we we were suffering from explosions, assassinations, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I was editing 
editing the work of uh, from Egypt and my edit like my my bosses asked me to edit because they trusted me so I was editing work from Egypt Saudi uh, Yemen and uh, and then in 2006 um, as I was still at home um, my colleague calls me and tells me you have to come to the office because the Israelis started bombing Lebanon it was in July 12th um, and um, this is when I um, um, I was working double shifts, getting to the office at 6 a.m., uh, finishing at 1 or 2 a.m. Um, I was sleeping for three hours. Um, I saw the most terrible pictures you could ever see, but I was like I was at the office. I was only seeing uh, I could hear the bombings, but I knew that I was safe at the office. Um, except for a few times you would feel that they were bombing you, but they were not. Uh, yeah, so I was only seeing, and I was, uh, as I always say, I was editing the pictures of photographers who were using their, like whose five senses were being used, but I was only seeing. So, um, so for 34, 33 days, I was doing this nonstop, um, we were all uh, working long hours. And then uh, after the war ended, we had we did the aftermath of the war. Uh, I was editing it. And then uh, in November 2006, I decided to quit. I was traumatized. And uh, uh, well, I suffered from PTSD because of um, the pictures that I saw. Uh, but I was not the only one. Obviously, we all suffered from that, all the photographers. Uh, but um, sadly, they gave each photographer, international photographer, a month off. But I was a local, so I didn't get a month off until I quit in November. And I had my off of photography. So um, for a few months, I didn't want to do photography. I actually hated photography. I didn't want to deal with the medium. I uh, uh, <clears throat> And then in July, actually in June, July, I can't remember, 2007, I decided to go see the houses and see the destruction that I had edited in my pictures, but I've never, I never saw it. Um, and basically, uh, I went with one journalist from Lebanon first as uh, like I, I went with him and then another journalist, a photographer from the UK who came and I told him I'll take him to the south. And then I decided uh, to um, take pictures of houses that were destroyed and abandoned by the Israeli uh, aggression on Lebanon. And um, I think it was in a way I was telling my story because, um, you know, there's something that people don't really understand as a as a local when you're uh, when you're living in a country that is being bombarded or um, after an explosion or anything. I mean, you know, when your life is very private and you're somebody who's living inside your house where everything is private inside and you show a, like a different side of you outside when you go out. So the problem is that I honestly, this is when I felt that wars um, turn the private into public. So those houses were closed. People were living inside. They had their furniture. Only people who were allowed to get into the house entered the house, people were knocking, they would open, You, they would allow you to get into the house. But the problem is when I went there, the houses were open. We went in and out without even asking the permission. Um, you could see everything on the floor. You could see the the clothes. Uh, you could see the the tastes of the people. You could learn a lot of the stories of the people. You could actually um, understand who was living inside. There were people. Uh, if they were women, uh, children. You could see toys. You could see the clothes of children. All the you could see pictures, keys. I mean, all the private belongings of people were were just uh, uh, in front of me and I could take pictures of them. So it kind of feels like those houses and those people's lives were, and okay, I'm going to use a um, kinder term, but they were violated by the war. Um, 
and then they were turned into public. So I don't know. The problem is I I didn't know anything about people's lives, if they died or not. The villages had hardly anybody inside, but uh, this is when I decided to do those houses to show what wars do to people's lives. So, uh, Dali, I'm... I'm... I, I'm wondering if um, a lot of the images that you saw during that frenetic period of those 33 days during the war influenced um, this uh, direction that you took because your this work was very slow work. I mean, in the sense that, you know, it, it, it's, it, it stays away from that kind of sensationalism of war photography, but rather, uh, uh, you know, you are, are documenting these houses. And as you said, these spaces that have been, you know, violated and, and you know, these um, uh, private lives have become public as a result. And, you know, was it perhaps a, a reaction to this um this idea that like, you know, you were seeing this, you were living in this, but people per perhaps weren't paying attention to the kind of long standing impact that, uh, pe that, the, that the war had. And it, you know, uh, uh, triggered this, uh, you know, desire in you to make that um, known, um, you know, or, or it, was there mm -hmm. other motivations? You know, Samshi, when I went there, uh... there was silence, actually. It was not like during the war when, uh... I mean, I could, I could, when I was at the office in downtown, in downtown Beirut, I could actually hear the bombings. And uh, the first time they, the, the Israelis bombed, uh, bombed uh, the southern suburbs, I honestly thought that I was, uh, we were being bombed um, because it was, it's really close. But uh, I remember I was talking to one editor in London and I told him, oh my God, they started bombing us. And he told me, is there a shelter? Go leave everything. And then we heard that they had bombed the southern suburbs. So I could, I mean, it was really like a continuous violating sound of bombings. Mm -hmm. And the problem is that you could obviously see this in the pictures of the photojournalists. You could see the 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 violence, the the like you could see death. I, I saw I saw images that I still see until now and they were like they're so terrible of um of uh, the problem is that also when you're dealing with um, something that you're, I mean, I obviously like everybody, I was a victim of this war. I didn't want this war to happen. I was somebody who was sitting at my home, and then all of a sudden I had to edit images, like really terrible of uh, a criminal act that has like was being done on the country, and. Uh, uh, like the pictures that you see were so terrible that at some point your brain your brain decides to um, to log off and you become numb to what you're seeing just because you want to protect yourself. And actually, after the, the war ended a few months later, uh, without like, honestly, I was sitting at the office and my tears were falling without me even looking at anything graphic. It was just pictures and I was crying and this is when i thought okay i was not fine and it's coming out um the the thing is that when i went to the south honestly i could feel the abandonment i could feel the you could feel it i mean i i was not i didn't go there wanting to do i mean it was not that i had this uh in my head and I, and I wanted to take pictures. Like I didn't re like I didn't uh, plan it. I just went there and I saw it and I was shocked by how nothing is private anymore and everything is public. And I felt honestly, like this is what my life happened in the war. I was receiving calls and messages and like constant messages on my phone and on my screen without I mean, all the time. So even my life is not private anymore, right? So this is what I wanted to to take pictures of the the the, the terrible thing that the wars do, but it was also how silent it was and. Um, uh, and I wanted, actually, it was kind of also because I didn't want to take pictures after the war. I hated photography. I wanted to change my job, but I felt that it was a kind of reconciliation with the photography. And I am a very calm person. Like I am a very calm photographer. I'm not calm in real life, but I, I am a very calm photographer. When I go take pictures, I kind of try to see what 
I'm seeing in front of me without any expectations. I try to document the, the, what I see and not what I have in my head, like no preconceptions. I decide to, okay, this is what I have in front of me. I have to show it the way it is, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, I don't know. I felt that it was kind of a respect to the houses and to the people whose lives were put in danger. Mm -hmm. so i'm not sure i mean and actually i turned into color because it was not the romantic side anymore of photography it was there i was part of this war that i was taking pictures of and it was not like when iraq and border of iraq i was not only a viewer i was also a victim of the war <laughs> no thank you for that um uh Daddy, and thank you for being so open about the kind of impact that it had and continues to have but um i want to uh, move on to the missing which I, I i feel is like your most well-known work and you know uh i think one of you know all your work is important but this one because of what you've been doing in the kind of duration with which you've been working with this project on um and and we'll go through the pictures as you're talking. You don't have to talk about the pictures individually, but maybe start by talking about what was the spark that started this project and perhaps maybe tell us about the project and what started this and um, tell us about, you know, I keep asking you and maybe uh, I'm going to put you on the spot, like, you know, when is this project going to finish in the sense that I know that this project will never finish in the, in, in, given the, 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 given the work that uh, it tr it's trying to document, but um, you know, where are you going with this? So okay so basically after 2006 i realized that if i wanted to live in lebanon uh i needed to uh start understanding what happened during the war that i was also a victim of like everybody else in the country so i was born in um two years before the war so in 1973 <laughs> and um i lived like I was two when the war started. I was uh, I lived fifteen years of wars. I was living in a in a town that was not in Beirut, which was kind of easier because I was not in like Beirut and the south and other areas suffered much more. But the two last years of the wars, I was also uh, living in on the stairs of the building hiding from the shelter like from the sheds and uh and the bombs that fell uh like some of them fell 20 meters from my building and so um i decided we can no more running away telling the stories of others i need to tell the story that i lived and you know well, when the war ended i started uh, university and then i started meeting people and then you know you hear from uh, somebody like uh, yeah you know this person got kidnapped during the war and then this that person got got kidnapped and this father like the father of this person got kidnapped etc and then i started meeting friends whose parents were kidnapped and whose loved ones were, were kidnapped and then as i told you i was running away from anything related to lebanon and its story and its miserable war but then i decided that if i like i honestly need to learn what happened because you know in lebanon the history books do not tell the stories of the war uh, because they still didn't decide who is the guilty one and who started the war and who is the one to blame. So basically, um, I started meeting uh, with... Uh, Actually, also when I was doing, uh, when I was working as a photo editor for the AP, what happened is that in 2005, my colleague told me uh, some, uh, there are some people, uh, there are some people demonstrating below, uh, like under the, the building uh, about their missing loved ones. So can you take pictures of that? And this was the first time I saw them also. I saw women who had pictures of uh, their loved ones. So basically what happened is that... Uh, I started uh, meeting families. I went to the tent that they had uh, set in in downtown Beirut in 2004, five, five, can't remember, uh, just a few months before the Syrian troops withdrew from Lebanon. And I started going there in 2009 and I started meeting the families, And but I didn't know how to do the photography. I didn't know how to tell the stories of those people. Uh, and it was a year after. It takes me a long time, honestly, to decide how to take pictures of a personal project. 
so uh what happened is that i started doing the pictures um i decided that it's going to be analog images uh i'm going to be a very slow photographer i am a very slow photographer i observe a lot so uh, i decided it's going to be with the, a medium format uh, analog photography and i started doing portraits and um it was i mean i was really not sure about the photography that i was doing because i'm always i always take time to understand if i'm doing right if i'm doing wrong at the end of the day i have this big responsibility of telling the stories of people and it's not my story i mean it's the stories of people and i have to tell it the the best way i i do it as a as a like as as like um out of respect and out of responsibility also. Um, so basically, uh, I didn't do much photography. And then in 2010, uh, Benjamin Chesterton from Duck Rabbit got in touch with me when he saw the work. Uh, he saw a conversation um, with York Goldberg, uh, right? <laughs> yeah. uh, on conscientious. Conscientious. <laughs> All right. So uh, he saw the work that I did on the abandoned houses and we started the conversation. And then I told him I was working on the missing. And then he came to Lebanon. Uh, he had two a pilot uh, projects to do with two photographers. So he came to Lebanon to work on me with that. We did the conversation, we did the interviews, uh, but I hadn't done any photography. And I actually decided in, like he wanted photos for multimedia that... Um, uh, I'm not sure if you saw it, uh, but anyway, uh, so in three days, I visited the families and I took pictures that were part of the multimedia. So basically, this picture was made in 2014. The pictures I've made before were in 2010, and in 2012, I did another series of photos, and in 2014, I did another series of photos. But the war in Syria had started, and I was really busy documenting the Syrian refugees' lives because I I had um, many uh, assignments with NGOs and newspapers, etc. So I didn't go back to this project. Um, but then there are so many things that are happening in the country. At the end of the day, I mean, it's a continuous struggle about telling the stories of people and it's the missing and then the Syrian refugees and then after this, we had the August blast. So you get to a point where it's too much to handle. So basically, this project is on pause. Very sadly, is uh, this woman passed away, by the way, a month and a half after I took a picture of her. Most of the mothers that I photographed uh, passed away also. Um, in the past month and a half, I know four mothers who died uh, without knowing the fate of their loved ones, uh, which is so terrible. But this is what it's, this is what's happening in Lebanon. It's a continuous uh, right. uh, war crimes and then amnesia and then resilience and then war crime, amnesia, resilience. So this is a really bad cycle that is that keeps on happening because of the politic, uh, politics in the country, because of the amnesty law in 91. We're still facing the same miserable situation. And yeah. <laughs> Okay, I'm conscious of the time, and you know, uh, we, uh, I'm sorry. No, 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 not at all. I think that you have so much to uh, say, and there's so much to kind of learn, and 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 uh, uh, from you that uh, I want to make sure that we we cover as much as we can. So, um, so uh, uh, if we move on to the next slide, um, uh, so this is a good cue to talk about your next project, which you did mention that um, is, you know, so you've been working on the missing, uh, you know, over different um, you know time periods, and then uh, you've. Been, as you said, you know, events in Lebanon have, uh, you know, prompted you to take work on other projects. So this is a project that you have been doing, documenting the Syrian refugees that found themselves in Lebanon as a result of the the war uh, in that started in 2011, um, the civil war, unrest, uprising, whatever you want to call it. Um, and so this is a, a work that you did on your mobile phone, I think, for the most part. And um, tell us about the project. And is it something that you're continuing to do since there's still, there, you know, Syrian refugees still live in, in Lebanon? Uh, so basically, this was not made with my phone. Everything that is square, I do pictures, like square pictures. Most of my Instagram is, uh, is actually uh, with the phone taken with the phone but this was not uh this was an assignment for um inter international ngo uh this one also um 
Um, so basically, I was asked by uh, many NGOs to to tell the stories of the Syrians, uh, different sides of the story. Um, this was with the UNHCR. The other one was with Caritas, I think, can't remember. Um, but so basically, uh, so I go and they ask me to do. I mean, it's this is more quick than the missing because I don't really, I cannot be very conceptual about the project because I don't have the time. I have a day or two or three or five. Um, uh, I don't think people, I mean, I'm, uh, I still did, I mean, I did for many years uh, a lot of work about the Syrians, but then with everything happening in Lebanon and the world, um, okay, I'll tell you about the story in particular. Um, so basically I had, uh, uh, I had many assignments until a few years ago. Uh, I don't think the world uh, cared about the Syrian refugees anymore. So, uh, and it's not a private project. Like tomorrow I have an assignment uh, with an NGO working with the Syrian refugees, but it's like, ve like very little. It's uh, not many... Uh, stories about it. Uh, the media is not interested, to be honest. It's mostly the NGOs now. Uh, my assignments now with the media are mostly about what's happening in the country or like, for example, a few weeks, um, a, cu a couple of months ago, I had an assignment about uh, the boat that, uh, you know, I mean, we have lots of my, uh, immigrants who decide to flee by uh, by sea and then the boats are sinking so I have many assignments of this side or about poverty or about the situation in Lebanon or about cholera or I did assignments on the on COVID in Lebanon with the so basically this picture was part of, a, of a, uh, an article about the gay community in Lebanon, uh, the Syrian gay community who fled Syria because of uh, worries of being killed. And uh, obviously, I mean, I have this, uh, and I, I think that people, photographers should uh, like should really be worried about people's lives and their like the people in their pictures so every time somebody is worried about being in a in a and like showing their faces uh, i always tell them i'm not going to so i try to take pictures without showing their faces i mean the, the last thing i want to do is actually put anybody in danger just to get uh like a sexy picture or whatever so um so basically what I do is I go and tell the stories. This guy was on uh, one one um one app. I can't remember I can't remember the name of the app, but he was on the app and uh, he was trying to hook up with somebody. And um you know I'm I mean especially him we became friends and uh, every holiday he sends me a message uh, uh uh, and he worries about me, but uh, yeah, on and off, he's not in Lebanon anymore. Thanks. Um, and then, um, uh, and then I'm going to uh, ask you to talk about your next project, uh, so we can move forward. But this is also part of the refugees project, and I love this. I love um, how you photograph objects because you know you almost kind of you know bring life to the the, the story using um, but also, objects, and you've been doing that for a while through all but, your projects. So. But also, sorry, the picture before the woman uh, was worried about being photographed, and he was she was a seamstress. Mm -hmm. So basically, I told her, don't worry, I'm not going to show your face. Why don't you hold them? And this is when I took the pictures. I mean, those yeah. pictures. I mean, I, I know that we can do really interesting images without showing the faces or putting anybody in danger. So we don't have to do it. It's not about taking the picture, doing a scoop and then leaving uh, whatever. I mean, if they're worried, they're worried, even if there's nothing to worry about. But I mean, if somebody tells me I want to photograph you, I'm somebody who doesn't like to be photographed. It's something that I would say no. Know, and I refuse, uh, I wouldn't yeah. like to photograph me. So the next project, um, so as you know, my mother, uh, my mother has Alzheimer's. Uh, she had Alzheimer's um, for a while now and I've been caring for her. I don't live with her, but uh, I used to stay with her a lot. Now I can't because I have uh, a lot of responsibilities with work. So uh, I go and take care of her a few days a week and I spend hours with her. And um, 
so basically, uh, I started doing photographs of the different phases she went through. <laughs> this is one. This is one of the last phases. If, um, this is very new. My mother. Uh, if you, if you, I mean, I, maybe people should go and read the captions site, um, so they. Um, yeah. They can learn more about it without me telling it. But basically, I was my mother now can't move. Uh, she used to sew, uh, sew a lot, but now she can't. She can't do anything. She's uh, bed bound and she can't hold a spoon anymore. She can't uh, move anymore. We have to carry her. Uh, we have to ask her if she wants water and she can say yes or no. Uh, I have to feed her myself or my sister or my brother. Or we used to have. Like, I mean, all the helpers uh, that had caring for her, the carers. But now she's in a phase where I can't, I mean, I, I hardly try to show. This is like an earlier stage when my mother used to sew and she was capable of doing this. Not anymore. Uh, basically, I'm not sure if you put some images of the small pieces on the... Yes, picture. it's coming right up. So what happened is that my mother used to sew a lot and she, like all of a sudden, she started doing different shapes, like big ones, small ones, triangles, uh, small triangles, etc. So at one time I went to see her and um, this was the last one I did actually. Uh, this was done in August 2, uh, uh, 2022 days before the Beirut port explosion. So basically what happened is that I started going to my mother's all of a sudden and looking at the boxes where she had her, uh, her, her, so like her pieces. And then all of a sudden I could see, uh, like small pieces. And I used to, I'm not sure if you have another one of this, of those. Um, no, you chose no this I'm one. afraid not. I'm afraid it's not. Okay. It's okay. I mean, they can see them if they want to. So basically, I started seeing those small pieces and I used to put them on the floor. My mother wouldn't recognize that she was the one who did them. And she would look at me amused, like, what are you doing? And I used to put them in a form of a canvas, take a picture of it, post it on Instagram and tell the story behind it. My mother, like the, the way my mother was doing things. So this was in August 2. This was the last one I did. Uh, you have two first ones on the carpet then in summer we removed the carpet so you have two different ones and the forms kept changing uh you had those the random forms and then you had lines etc so th these were the last uh, series that i found i put them on the floor i took a picture two days later the blast happened and then i couldn't see my mother for three weeks and then when i went back to see my mother my mother stopped doing those small pieces it's like something and like this is what i always post this image and i say that this is what the blast did to my mom uh, and her brain is very vulnerable so can you imagine what it did to us but we're not as vulnerable or as her so my mom went back to doing like normal ones long ones and now sadly she can't do anything um sometimes she remembers us sometimes not but yeah <laughs> and um that's a really good segue to ask you about the project that you did after that in which i think you're continuing to do which is uh, people who are affected by the blast um so mikey if you can cue the next picture um maybe you can uh, tell us uh, uh, as we can wrap this up and then invite questions um uh tell us about this project very briefly and um so these photos that you're showing now are part, I mean, after the, the blast, I didn't take pictures. I was asked to do ass assignments. Otherwise, I wouldn't have gone on the street, to be honest. I'm, I, 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 I can't deal with death. Uh, so basically, uh, I started meeting people uh, through my assignments on the, on the blast. And I worked for two months, at least, uh, for, uh, for different uh, publications, mainly Le Monde, uh, the magazine and a newspaper, and then other NGOs, etc. And then I worked with uh, different um, publications but basically what happened is like for example this is Samer whose daughter was uh, injured uh, he uh, he lived and he worked uh, at the gate next to the gate number three of the port and when the blast happened his girl was really injured Bisan, she was six and then six days later she died and we saw him with my with the journalist um, uh, a few months after the death of his daughter and i remember when we met him he was so angry um i can't remember what what my friend said but something like this guy is a food food uh, 
food uh, like, like um, he's crazy of pain from pain he got crazy honestly he was like anyway so uh two months after i was asked by um some like by an ngo or local ngo to work on the stories of the uh, victims of the blast and i started working on it it's taking much longer than expected because it's more conceptual it's going to be on a website um in two months i hope and it's different from what i did it's not the quick it's not the fast it's calmer and it's more conceptual about what i wanted what the message i wanted to convey right um, we we'll move on to questions, but before we do, yeah. I just want to say, I mean, this portrait and, and many other portraits that you shared um, from the Missing Project and others, um, they're just a, 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 you know, a testament to your a, you know, photographic talent, but also um, how your work is so important in in depicting a lot of these people who have, um, you know, felt the brunt of the war as, as you know, very dignified and, and uh, you know, and the the strength and even the picture of um summer uh for example the one before um you know there is this quiet rage but it's it, it's also very dignified and, and beautiful and you have this mashallah this this skill or this um you know ability to to make these really powerful portraits and um you know uh uh I, I commend you for that, but also I know that, um, you know, uh, uh, there's they're, they're beautiful and important work. Um, and of course, these are not easy topics. So, you know, you, you, it's clear that you are spending a lot of time with these, uh, uh, with the sitters and, you know, understanding their stories and al al allowing for that space to emerge where you can take these kind of photos. So, you know, uh, uh, other than, you know, your, 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 your eye for a good photo, I think that's very important to point out that, you have this ability to put people at ease and have them talk about things that are super difficult. And, um, and that's, uh, something that you should be very you know proud of. And I, I always share with young photographers, uh, your photos as an example of how to, um, portray pain and suffering in, in, in a, in a way that is dignified and, 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 um, heroic, um, so yeah, thank you. Thank you. No. <laughs> um, but it, it's because may, most probably, honestly, I think that um, I never tell my story. Uh, I go and tell the stories of people. I don't have preconceptions. It's all about them. It's not about me. Um, yeah, I, I don't. I mean, it's not that. I don't know. I, I don't know how to explain it. But I just um, already, I'm very uh, touched that people give me the permission to take photographs of them, and I out of respect uh i try to show them the best i can mm -hmm. right and i have to say uh, in my experience seeing a lot of work from the middle east especially you know uh, where there's a lot of work around photography and war and stuff i think that your work is uh, um you know an aberration rather than the norm in the sense that there is a lot of work that is very um you know uh, unfair or very uh, uh you know quick to uh or simplify you know uh, uh, work that very often um sensationalizes and um simplifies the issues and i think yours is um you know uh, 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 the, quite the opposite in that it's very poignant and very uh, reflective and very um thoughtful and um and yeah uh thank you for that and um so i have a question from um uh, Mikey, actually, um, who asks, uh, Dalia, what advice would you have for young photographers who feel like they also want to quit um, photography uh, because of trauma or because of the, you know, the, the heaviness uh, um, of the work? Uh, what, I mean, listen, I, I think I told you Samji, and I don't think uh, anybody should be ashamed of uh, that. Um, like I, I have been followed up by a, a, a psychologist and, uh, you know, I mean, I'm covering stories that are so traumatizing and so painful that I need that for myself. Mm -hmm. I cannot be collapsing in front of the families because they don't have to suffer from my um, mental, like, like, um, you know, from my problems. So I go there and I, I think that uh, to be able to tell their stories, I need to be helped. So I think that um, if photographers, I mean, I, I wanted to quit many times, to be honest, because it was so difficult and it is difficult. But I think that if photographers think that they are 
uh, capable, like they are uh, passionate about photography and telling the stories of others. Uh, it's not bad to seek help, right? In so many ways, like um, you can do whatever. Like a friend of mine is uh, going to do music therapy for me uh, in two months. So I'm willing to do that and I'm happy to do that and I'm happy to receive help. And um, and I've been uh, like, I've been through really many uh, falling apart uh, situations. And uh, yeah, I, I'm not, uh, it's, it's not something that I did. It's actually the wars that we are victims of. And I'm just a human being. So yeah, just seek help. It, it helps a lot, by the way. Thank you. Um, uh, the... And nothing to be ashamed of, right? Um, we have to say it all the time. Nothing to be ashamed of to, to say that we're not fine and we need help. Absolutely. I think it's very important. And I think that, um, you know, and in a way, I feel like the work that you do um, uh, also reflects, you know, when you say that I don't tell my own stories in a way, it's your work that is doing um, uh, your own um, storytelling. Um, but uh, we have a question from Lamise. I'm going to see if I can uh, unmute her. Um, okay, I think, Lamise, you can unmute yourself now. First, I want to thank you. Thank you. Your photo of M. Aziz was very inspiring to me. And I've been working on a project about um, the lives of the families of kidnapped children in Egypt. And when I started my project, I thought that I would find so many photography projects about kidnapped children, but I didn't. And like everybody was advising me to take like shaky portraits of the families. And I didn't like that and continued photographing differently. And then I stumbled upon your photo of Emma Aziz and I was very impressed of how simple and powerful. And because of your photo, I felt that I'm on the right track. So my question is, did you have a vision in mind of how you wanted to photograph the families or do you usually like develop that while working? Uh, let me, this is what I said, actually, I, first of all, thank you so much. Honestly, this, this means a lot, uh, all, everything you said. And I'm really happy that uh, the work that I did uh, helped in a way. <laughs> um, as I told you, as I, I, as I said earlier, when I'm working on a project, I tried to do a lot of research and I went so many times to Amaziz until she started showing me things. And this is when I started taking pictures of the belongings that she kept from her sons and from other families. Obviously, there's this um, necklace that I took pictures of. And for example, I don't have a portrait of this woman. Uh, I have a picture of the necklace of her, like she kept from her brother who went missing. We're not sure if he was kidnapped or not. So basically what I do is just go listen and then see what they will show you and let them open up. And then when they open up, you will honestly see wonders because they will start to show you so many things because they want they want a person to tell the stories that they're suffering from. So just go without any um, expectations and start listening to the stories. This is what I this is what I do all the time. Great advice. Um, that, OK. Uh, thank, thanks, Dalia. So there's another question from uh, Salima Hamrini, uh, who asks, do you think there is a limit of age to have a career as a documentary photographer? Uh, no, I don't think there's a limit of in, like, uh, in age. I actually, uh, I think that I started late also because, uh, I mean, I have friends who didn't even study photography and they are some of the, my favorite photographers in the world. And they quit the school at 16, for example, and they didn't even do uh, university. And they're some of the, my favorites. I, I have other friends who studied literature and they're some of my favorite photographers also. And I studied architecture for two years and a half and I studied photography for five years. And then it took me such a long time to become a photographer, to be honest, because I, I'm in a country where you are not really helped. And when I started photography, we didn't have internet. <laughs> like, 
So it wasn't that you could research. I used to do my research at the at the library at university, right? So no, no, there's no, no uh, listen, there's no limit to anything in life. Uh, I think so. Um, uh, you, <laughs> Salima has another question. Uh, um, how to take more intimate photos when the person is reserved or shy or um, uh, a bit withdrawn? Any advice for Salima? Yeah, I think uh, this is what I said to Lamis, right? That uh, try to uh, get them to trust you, uh, show them other pictures that you've done. I always do this. For example, I show them pictures and they trust me when they see the pictures that I've done. So they see that I'm uh, engaged, that I want to tell their stories, that I'm like they see the portraits that I do, they understand what I'm doing. And this is when I start taking pictures. And then sometimes I honestly don't take pictures until like I come back a year later or a few months later. Don't don't stress the people. They if you stress them, they will not show you that you can you will not be able to take what you want. Okay, I think that's time for the last question, which is going to come from me, uh, which is where is your website? Because one of the best parts about doing this today for me was to get your Dropbox links of all your projects because I get fleeting views from them on Instagram or an assignment photo here or there. But you have this beautiful, important work. And why can't we get this on a website for the whole world to see? Um... I don't know, Samji. I... <laughs> I don't know. It's a question that everybody asks me. I just, uh, you know, I think we talked about it and I talked about it with, um, I get so disappointed with what photography is like, is going and it's like what's happening with photography lately that uh, sometimes I just uh, like, uh, like move back and just, I feel like I have to do my work and tell the stories. And if people like, uh, and people who will see it, will see it uh, one day, one day, you know, what's her name? The, 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 the photographer they discovered, uh, <laughs> Vivian Meyer. Um, yeah, no, uh, yeah. <laughs> we, we will, we will touch base after and we will Sorry. get this website going for you. I'm said, I said, we'll get in touch. Um, I'll get in touch with you later and we'll make this website happen because this work needs to be shown and be there as a, think about it as the help that you'd be giving younger photographers to kind of handle topics of this kind of sensitivity. So um, there is a website that is going to be on because I have to, and it's part of a contract. It's going to be on in November in, in January at some point, hopefully maybe a bit later, like, hopefully not about the victims of the blast but basically uh is mikey saying exactly for the website <laughs> yes i'm sure he is because um you know we've just seen this beautiful work and we'd like to yes he's saying um so uh, uh so, yeah and, and uh, <laughs> there, i don't know one day one day i will and then you know people don't even know how i look like in lebanon so they know my work but they don't know what I look okay, like. You know what? If you don't get a website up like uh, uh, soon, then I'm going to get a website for you. And I'm just going to like catfish you and say that I'm, uh, I'm Dalia Khamisi. No, no, no. I have. Honestly, <laughs> I have a website. It's hidden. It has been hidden, hidden for the past 10 years. Yeah. It's okay. It's not about me. Haras, but it doesn't have to be about you. It, 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 you know, and that's what's beautiful about you. You have like no, virtually no ego. And like for a photographer, that's quite rare. And, and I, there are people on this chat right now on this link, like Jessica Murray, for example, who is <laughs> who's echoing the same thing, and Tamara's on this, and we'll all say the same that um, uh, you know, we are your biggest fans, and that like your work needs to you know go out and inspire, and um, you know, and also kind of shed light on the stories that you do. But, but something <laughs> to be fair, I have my Instagram and I post images there, honestly. And then just one one thing is Jessica is one of my favorite people in the world, and I think she she helps everybody. I mean, this woman is amazing. And Tamara is one of my favorite people also in this world. And I miss holding her hand in the plane <laughs> while traveling in Rawiya, while we were in Rawiya. And uh, yeah, so that's it. Th honestly, thanks a lot. And Somji, you are one of my favorite people in this world, even though we don't really... Uh, um, we don't really talk a lot. And I think this is Russia, uh, also my one of my favorite people. I, mean, I have so many favorite people in this world, which is so sweet. But anyway, I mean, one day, one day it's hidden. I have this, um, I have this website. It's under construction, but I have so many things inside, <laughs> but it's not out yet. 
Well, well anyway, we'd, we'd all we, we'd all be very, you'd make us all very happy by getting it all, all up there. And I want to thank everybody for um, spending um, uh, the time with us today. Um, and thank you, uh, Dalia, and thank you for you and all the work that you do. Um, you have no idea the um, how important the work is and how much we we love you for it. So thank you, everyone, and please stay tuned. Uh, thank you to Afrika for making this uh, possible. Uh, um, you know, Mikey put, uh, and Afrika put on some amazing uh, programs. Uh, it's one of my favorite podcasts to listen to everything from food to music to um, photography to other double exposure projects. So um, thank you, everybody, for joining us. Uh, and, and and thank you, uh, Dahlia. And thank you, everybody, for uh, being here. And um, and yeah, we'll put this up on YouTube soon and people can uh, see it and share it. Um, yeah. And I also really thank you for everybody who attended. It means a lot. Thank you. And to my friends who also uh, made sure to be there. So thank you. Thank you. Do, do you I have a prediction? My favorite people in this world also right sorry yes now i was gonna say do you have a prediction for who's gonna win the world cup uh la i just uh, don't want germany to win it i'm so sorry <laughs> for, for personal reasons nothing more i mean i have yeah but <laughs> la. all right thank yeah, you Dalia. good night thank good you evening so everyone and, uh, have a lovely evening and a lovely week ahead of you goodbye bye bye bye, bye.